My name is Dale Fredland, and in today's lecture, I would like us to look at the various ways that have been suggested to incorporate stress analysis into the assessment of the stability of soil and rock slopes. Let us start uh, today's with a brief review of the key observations made in lecture number one. First of all, we found that the problem was um, statically indeterminate if we just applied statics to the slope stability problem. Now, we've, we also talked about what we meant by indeterminacy. It meant that we have more unknowns than we have knowns. And so it, you, you must have an equal number of knowns and unknowns in order to solve the problem. So we talked about the various way, attempts that have been made to make the analysis determinate. And uh, another observation was from the first lecture was that the factor of safety was quite insensitive to the interslice force function. Um, it, you can assume quite a wide range of possibilities, and still the factor of safety calculations uh, did not vary uh, significantly. We also found out that the interslice force function, shear, was related to the slope of the ground surface. In other words, the, the resultant interslice force functions were largely controlled by the geometry of, at the ground surface. We also found that the limit equilibrium solution could satisfy either force or moment equilibrium or both. And we found that um, <coughs> the shape that uh, satisfies, the solution that satisfies both force and moment equilibrium were dependent on the shape of the slip surface. It depended on whether it was circular, planar, or composite. And we came to the conclusion that it is important to solve for the factor of safety that satisfies both moment and force equilibrium. Today, I, I will focus on three ways in which stress analysis has been brought into the uh, uh, assessment of the stability of the slope. Over on the left-hand side is the use of the linear elastic type of formulation. And I have two possibilities. One is where you use it to calculate the, re the direction of the resultant interslice forces. And the other is where you use it to calculate the normal stresses at the base of a slice. The calculation of the direction uh, of the interslice shear forces uh, was uh, proposed by Wilson in 1983, and uh, he used a linear elastic analysis to uh, generate a reasonable interslice force function. We covered that last day, so I won't say much more about it today. I will focus mainly on the second area here, where we calculate the normal stresses on the base of a slice using a stress analysis. That's what Colhawe and others did, but Colhawe is the main contributor in 1969. Over on the right-hand side, I say, what about the possibility of doing an elastoplastic analysis to calculate the stress state in uh, our continuum and deformations? And this gives rise to the shear strength reduction uh, procedure, where you need a new instability criteria to assess um, when you have converged on the right solution. I refer to the work of Griffiths and Lane. I realize there's many others that have also contributed to the formulation for shear strength reduction. I ended last day's lecture with a question. Is the normal force at the base of the slice, is it calculated as accurately as is possible? we noted that the various limit equilibrium methods differed in how they calculated the normal force. So there was a lot of focus on that normal force. That's what caused the difference between the, the different methods. Stated another way we can say is the normal for stress only dependent 
upon the forces on a single vertical slice because that's what we have uh, assumed to be the case for methods of slices. Stated another way here, can the soil mass stress state be more accurately calculated using the unit weight as a body force in a stress analysis? The schooler did a lot of work on ad addressing this question. On the left hand side, we see uh, a, a pictorial representation of the methods uh, of slices where we divide the sliding mass into a series of vertical uh, uh, slices and then some forces vertically to get the normal force. And depending upon what we assume for interslice forces, we got various values for the normal force and that gave rise to the different li limit equilibrium methods. Now when we come to do a stress analysis, we put it in the context of a boundary value problem. We um, take the entire continuum and put boundaries uh, shown by these red dashed lines and uh, we put boundary conditions on it and then switch on gravity and calculate the stress state in the entire mass. We can select any slip surface and at any point we can calculate the stress state. We can calculate the normal stress and the shear, uh, actuating shear uh, stress as well. And the question is, which is going to be preferable? To do it, a finite element analysis of the entire continuum or to calculate the normal force slice by slice? These are distinctly different methodologies for the calculation of the normal force at the base of a slice. Let me make it clear what we are doing. In the finite element analysis, we set boundaries around the continuum, put boundary conditions on, switch on gravity, and because we can draw a more, a more circle at any point in our mass and use the interpolation functions from the finite element analysis to get us the information we want at any point along a, a selected slip surface. There are two pieces of information we want to get from the Mohr diagram. We want it because we want to import two things into the limit equilibrium context. We're taking a continuum mechanics approach, getting stresses and importing them to uh, a point and we want to calculate the normal stress at the, on the sli sliding surface and we also want to calculate the actuating shear stress. Those two variables will allow us to calculate a factor of safety within the context of limit equilibrium analysis. But let's just see which is most accurate. To use vertical slices and get the normal force or to use the continuum mechanics approach. Limit equilibrium will give you, on this slip surface that goes through the toe of the slope, will give you these black symbol, symbols that are joined together. And this is the normal st stress, which can be converted to a force, along the selected slip surface. But when we do the finite element analysis and calculate the normal stress, we get this red line. And it starts to differ significantly as you approach the toe of the slope. Which one is correct? Well, you see the black dots, it never knew whether what happened beyond the toe, whether it was a vertical drop, whether it was a horizontal line or something in between or even vertical here. So it calculated stresses without knowing anything about the geometry. The finite element knew about the ground surface geometry and calculated these red points. The red ones are more accurate because they take into consideration the entire uh, um, geometry between the crest and the toe and beyond. One more example where the we select a deeper slip surface that goes 
beyond the toe of the slope. And this time, the black lines, one, uh, black symbols once again define the values from the limit equilibrium analysis. And they clearly show the distinct break at the toe of the slope. But when you do the finite element analysis, the effect of this toe gets smeared and the stresses are distributed throughout the continuum. And so the red dots are from the finite element analysis, and they will be the more accurate representation of the normal stress. Well, we could look at other examples, but this is sufficient. So once we have the normal force, we can then use it in the context of limit equilibrium analysis. But all of these type of formulations are called enhanced limit methods. Now, I may not like the name enhanced limit methods, but that seems to be the common terminology that's used when a finite element analysis is done within the context of a limit equilibrium. If we come down here, there's three different definitions, at least in the literature, as to how to define the factor of safety. I will just refer to the first one, Kalhawai, because it is most consistent with our thinking in soil mechanics, where um, we have the shear strength on the top and the actuating forces of shear on the bottom. Uh, the squares on the right in blue, I will not say anything more about them because that is where you have, uh, you invoke the shear strength reduction method. It's also a finite element method, but it is worthy of an entire lecture on its own. Today, the focus is going to be on doing a finite element stress analysis, but interpreting the results within the context of a limit equilibrium analysis. So looking at Culhawe in his definition of factor of safety, it's the summation of all of the resisting forces d that can be generated due to the shear strength of the soil. And that shear strength resistance is defined by the effective stress equation multiplied by the length over which it acts. That gives us the shear strength, and we sum them to get the shear force mobilized. And we notice in this equation, here is the normal stress that we input from the finite element analysis. On the bottom is the actuating uh, stress, shear stress. It is the mobilized shear force when we sum it over all the slip surface. So a linear elastic analysis is being used as a stress distribution function. Now, let's stop and ask, do a comparison between the stress-based slope stability analysis and a limit equilibrium method of slices. What is similar and what is different between those? This is, I emphasize once again, this class of stress-based methods is referred to as enhanced limit methods. What are the differences between using stress-based slope stability analysis and limit equilibrium? Well, first of all, we discover, if we go use the results from the finite element analysis, that our formulation and our solution becomes determinate. We have the equal number of equations and equal number of unknowns. It's no, there's no nonlinearity, no need for iteration. One pass through the equation solves the problem. We also should note that force and moment equilibrium are implicitly satisfied when we do the, the finite element analysis. Our factor of safety equation becomes linear, and that's the reason why we only require one iteration. So we would think that um, this has got a, a, a lot of um, uh, favorable attributes and reasons why this would not be a reason, should be a good approach to use. 
what are the similarities between what we did before and what we're doing now? We still have to assume the shape of the slip surface and search by trial and error to locate the critical slip surface. And our desire was to be able to have an analysis where the shape and the location were part of the solution. So we have not necessarily arrived yet, but it is we are stepping forward in soil mechanics history, looking at the steps of progress taken from the very early days till at present we're looking at stress-based slope stability analysis. So why hasn't, haven't stress-based slope stability methods been more extensively used? First of all, all stress analysis require that additional soil properties be input for the analysis. In its simplest form, there's a Young's modulus and a Poisson's ratio and maybe a dilution factor, uh, dilation factor. Uh, but the addition of additional soil properties scares geotechnical engineers away, especially a property that varies extensively over orders of magnitude. And even though it may not have an effect on the analysis, if, if the uh, soil is homogeneous, it's still um, geotechnical engineers wonder what to use very often. And it is, it all, they also don't like the fact that Poisson's ratio starts to have an effect, and even in some cases more significantly than Young's modulus. Secondly, there is the perception of inaccuracy related to using stresses from analysis that represents failure conditions. We're trying to look at as we approach failure, and we have two possible analysis to use, elastic stress analysis or elastoplastic analysis. On first thought, we would think we have to use elastoplastic. I will do some examples to show you so we understand the relationship between an elastic analysis and a plastic analysis when we do a stress analysis. So why haven't these stress-based methods been used more extensively? Well, there's a, last, a lack of experience database. We, uh, we have a lot of experience with limit equilibrium methods of slices, and we get a feel for it, and we get experiential knowledge of how to uh, do our engineering with that database, and we lack a database for stress-based methods. And there's also a lack of a comparative studies between the various methodologies. There's some comparative studies that have been done, but it doesn't appear to be uh, uh, sufficient. Now, that we're going to look at a, a couple of examples so we understand what, what changes when we go to enhanced limit methods. Here's a slope with a crest and a toe, and there's a sliding surface that I don't show here. But I do plot below here the actuating and the resisting shear stresses, the two components that came out of the ana uh, elastic-based analysis. And I plot them independently. I pl on the top are the red triangles that designate the shear strength. The shear strength at any point along the slip surface, it can calculate the shear strength as a normal stress is known. It can also calculate the actuating shear stress. And one thing we observe is that the actuating shear is below the shear strength. So there is more strength then there is actuating force. Our factor of safety is going to be greater than 1.0. And I, we have, I don't put down a Young's modulus, but a Poisson's ratio of 0.33. Uh, we'll look a little bit at the effect of Poisson's ratio too. So now I can take any point and I can divide the shear strength I have by the actuating shear and get a local factor of safety. So the concept of local factors of safety in addition to global factors of safety now is, comes into play when we go to stress-based analysis.
for that same problem I just showed you, th let's go to the red squares on the right here. I can plot local factor of safety. And I see how it varies across the sliding mass like this. Here's a factor of safety of one. It never reaches one. And it, it varies widely all the way up to a local factor of safety of six. But when I add these all together, I add together, or I sum, all the increments along the sliding surface, I get a global of 2.342. Let's remember that value, 2.342. And that was with the Poisson's ratio of 0.33. I changed Poisson's ratio to 0.48. So it's more like rigid body motion. And now the factor of safety, it doesn't change very much, 2.339. But the shape is very different. But when I sum them together, I have conserved energy, and I get almost the same value there. Now, on all the methods we looked at in the first lecture, one of the assumptions we had for limit equilibrium methods of slices was the assumption that all slices had the same factor of safety. So if I run on this same problem, run a Bishop's analysis, or in this case, Morgenstern Price would give you this, almost the same thing, here it is here. Morgenstern Price is gym, uh, general limit equilibrium, 2.356. Let's go, to just take this number here, 2.36. Almost the same as what we got for the stress analysis. So here's Bishop's method, 2.3. Six, It's constant. When I sum these, integrate along these, I get almost the same uh, value. Here's another e example where I compare uh, for this geometry. First of all, run uh, Morgenstern Price or Jenna Limit Equilibrium and get this green, green lines represented. And it comes out at the toe and has a factor of safety of 1.74. When I run the uh, stress analysis, enhanced limit analysis with Poisson's ratio 0.3 and 0.48, I get values here that are slightly different. And the location of the critical slip surface changes. It goes beyond the toe, and it gives a slightly different value, a little lower value. Well, I have run parametric studies with my graduate student schooler where a variety of stability numbers, which is varying friction angle and varying cohesion, and I plot the results. Gen uh, Morgenstern price, Poisson's ratio 0 0.3, 0 0.48, and although there is some difference at certain values, slight differences, they virtually overlie one another. In other words, limit equilibrium and stress analysis give us the same results. How can that be? Because energy is conserved in both analysis. The, my, the potential energy that's available for now for distribution is the difference between the crest and the toe of the slope. We may distribute the stresses a little differently within the mass, but the differences are, are, are secondary. Now, if you get to complex geometries and complex stratigraphy, we have to verify this all over again. But for simple slopes with one soil, we can see we get the same, virtually the same answer. So incorporating stress analysis results, what, what do we find? Normal and actuating shear stresses from a linear elastic analysis appear to provide reasonable representation of the stresses in, this, in, in the slope. The enhanced limit method uh, proposed by Culhawe in 1969 appears to open the way for simulation 
of more complex geometries. Of course, we have to be able to input the stress deformation properties as well. Another observation is that the global factors of safety appear to be essentially the same as limit equilibrium factors of safety for most simple slope geometries. The selection of Poisson's ratio has some effect on the calculated enhanced limit factors of safety. It's surprising uh, that we would have probably thought that Young's modulus should be the variable that's going to cause some differences, but it's actually, it appears to be Poisson's ratio is the more important one to uh, accurately designate. Another question now then to ask is, can the shape and the location of the slip surface be made part of the solution? There are other possible procedures whereby the shape and look of the critical slip surface can be determined. We're asking the question, are there other possible procedures that can give us the shape that is most critical? Is it possible for the analysis to give us the location of the critical slip surface. This is what we wanted to have in analysis, and a slope stability analysis that not only gave us a factor of safety under a series of assumed conditions, but to tell us what the shape and the location of the critical slip surface is. Well, we're going to talk about that in the next lecture for shear strength reduction. But even before we go there, we can still look at stress-based uh, analysis and we can use optimization techniques such as dynamic programming to minimize the ratio between shear strength available to the actuating shear stresses in the soil mass. And I refer to the work of Ha here. In, sh in dynamic programming methodology, we superimpose another grid over top of our continuum with one point below the surface of the geometry. And then we can search to find the pathway that it's, it's an optimization technique which will give us the lowest factor of safety. The factor of safety is, is uh, defined as Kalhawi suggested the summation of all our strengths divided by the summation of the actuating shear stresses. Here's an example. I just show one example where we'll start with Morgenstern, Price, and Bishops, and this dashed line represents the slip surface that was found to be critical for Morgenstern Price. So we let it search. We assumed a shape, though, and the shape is circular, and we get that, and we get a factor of safety of 1.17. Now, if we use the stress analysis and the enhanced limit, equi lim limit equilibrium analysis, we get a factor of safety slightly less. It found a location um, because it, it takes into account changes in the slope of the geometry at the ground surface. This other line here with the crosses and the li line going through it, it's not quite circular. It is the shape and the location found through using dynamic programming. And it gave a factor of safety of 1.02. It said it believes there is a shape and a location that is slightly more critical than the circular shape. And this is for the analysis Poisson's ratio 0.33. That's the only one I'll show here. I want to go through a, a, a mind experiment bef before I conclude this lecture. Let's pick a geometry, and we want to compare the use of an elastic analysis and an elastoplastic analysis. This is very crucial to moving forward in trying to improve the analysis that we can do. I'm going to use uh, 
dynamic programming, and we will search for the critical slip surface for using an elastic analysis and an, elasto and an elastoplastic analysis. This is the work from Dr. Stenson. And so he takes a geometry and super and does a seepage analysis and combines the two, then uses the linear elastic model and cal finds the shape and location and the factors of safety. He also uses a elastoplastic and does an elastic uh, elastoplastic in stress analysis and we'll compare the results. The first example I pick is for a slope or that Dr. Stenson picked. A slope uh, with this black line showing the ground surface and these are the soil properties as cohesion and a friction angle. With using a linear elastic analysis, he gets these blue symbols. And this is using the search routine from dynamic programming. And it for, finds a shape for the critical slip surface and draws a line through them. If he does, it gets a factor of safety of 1.365. If he does an elastoplastic analysis, he gets these black triangles and it follows the same line and he gets a factor of safety of 1.365. He also did a limit equilibrium analysis using Morgenstern Price and gets this gray line here, just slightly above. We don't need to go into the explanation for the slight differences. The factor of safety is slightly different. It gives the factor of safety 1.34, virtually the same thing. Now, we're going to look at um, the factor of safety locally as he goes across that same problem. So this, this set of results is for this example problem that I just explained. And if you follow here, the elastic analysis gives you the blue symbols. And the factors, local factors of safety are always greater than one, greater than one, until he hits the, the toe of the slope and there is just a po small portion at the toe of the slope which is overstressed. When he comes to do the elastoplastic analysis, it brings this point up here because it goes into plastic. It can't go below one factor of safety of one. It distributes the stresses back. and doesn't even do enough. Uh, it's not enough, though, to even change the computed factor of safety. This is for a homogeneous dry slope with a factor of safety greater than 1.0. Now let's take one more case where the factor of safety approaches 1.0 or goes less than 1.0. I have reduced the angle of friction simply to get the factor of safety down. And the elastic, linear elastic enhanced limit equilibrium analysis gives us a value of 0.868. And these blue symbols define the critical slip surface. If we do a Morgenstern price analysis, we get this gray line, and it almost follows the same. And the factor of safety, 0.862, almost the same as the elastic analysis. Then the elastoplastic analysis, it finds a very different critical slip surface, and the factor of safety is greater than 1 because it keeps redistributing the stresses until it finds something that goes into complete plastic equilibrium. So what, it shows, what this appears to be telling us is that the elastic analysis gives us the same as limit equilibrium, and they are less than 1. And factors of safety less than 1.0 are very meaningful to the geotechnical engineer. He knows what kind of decisions to make if the factor of safety goes below one or even approaches one. Now in that same analysis, 
I just showed where the, the slip surface was, uh, went deeper. Why did it go deeper? Because in the elastic analysis, linear elastic, we get factors of safety less than one. And those have to be redistributed back for the elastoplastic. And they move them up. It can never allow it to go below 1.0. And so the linear elastic gave us the correct value we want to work with. And this is incorrect. Um, but let me just leave you with one additional slide. Supposing in the elastoplastic analysis, we take the deformed shape, the deformed shape predicted by the elastoplastic analysis. And the deformed shape is shown by this red dashed line. And now we do that, take that as our geometry. And we do linear elastic analysis and we get 1.00. Elastoplastic, 1.0. Morganson price, 1.0. So we start to get an idea of, of what happens in the interaction between elastic analysis and limit equilibrium and elastoplastic analysis. Th these are important um, questions that we have to resolve within our mind as we move forward in trying to get better and better understanding of the assessment of slope stability. So what can I summarize in, about linear elastic stress analysis? Because that's what the focus of this lecture was. The enhanced limit analysis is proposed by Calhoway. Uh, the formulation uses linear elastic model for calculating stress distributions. And to our surprise, it gives us virtually the same answers as, uh, as limit equilibrium method of slices. We also found out that uh, you can use search routines. You can search for shape and location and use in dynamic programming. So dynamic programming comes to the rescue in terms of shape and location, and we are still using uh, stress analysis uh, for c calculating our factor of safety. Now, shear strength reduction method. This is another methodology that provides information on the shape and the location of the critical slip surface. It is the shape and location are part of the analysis. This is an important analysis for us to uh, understand fully and to discuss as well. And so that is going to be the topic of another lecture, and it is worthy of another lecture. And with that, I say thank you for listening to this lecture. And uh, I hope if you have some questions about it, that we have an opportunity to uh, have a discussion. Thank you very much.